Virginia was just the first southern state to outlaw capital punishment. I know for a lot of people, feelings are very strong about the subject of capital punishment, but I thought it might be useful to lay out a case for, which means in favor of, capital punishment. The case from the Bible is very strong, but I won't be talking about that today. Instead, I'll be giving a case from logic that's in addition to what the Bible says. Maybe another day I could talk about what the Bible says about it. So first of all, my first point, a society that outlaws the death penalty doesn't send a message of reverence for life, but instead one of moral confusion. If the greatest punishment for murder is life in prison where the perpetrator is protected, fed, and cared for, it yells loudly that the life of the perpetrator is worth more than the life of the victim. See, the victim was brutalized. The perpetrator is housed and fed and given health care and protection until the day of natural death. See, this is a false system of value. We're telling the perpetrator, whatever you may do to someone else, your life is secure and will be protected. It's a contradiction to protect the life of the offender in exchange for the lost and irreplaceable life of the victim. Just as a nation that refuses to go to war will find itself subdued by warmongering regimes, a society, society that will not put its most barbaric criminals to death will find itself overrun by people who have no qualms about putting the innocent to death. My second point. Detractors claim that capital punishment is not a deterrent. But I respond, so what? The point is not particularly to deter others, though that would be of benefit. The point instead is punishment for the horror that has been perpetrated. Besides, deterrence is impossible to measure. How can anyone know how many people decided not to commit a murder out of fear of capital punishment? And so we don't really know how much of a deterrence it is. Number three, detractors claim that too many mistakes are made and that innocent people are killed. Well, this is undeniable. But the science, DNA analysis and other forensics, is getting better. And it's true in any situation that mistakes are made, we strive to eliminate them. Our system of justice has safeguards in place to do everything possible to prevent the misapplication of justice. But because sometimes mistakes are made, it's not warrant to shut down the whole system. If that were the case, we would shut down science and academics, manufacturing, business. No system will ever eliminate all injustices. We have a responsibility, however, to do the absolute best we can with what we have to work with. Number four, it is argued that two wrongs don't make a right. Just because one life was taken doesn't mean it's right to take another life. It's the idea that being pro-life requires that we always protect all life at all costs. But this is not true. Sometimes we set a fire to stop a fire. Sometimes war is justified. Sometimes lethal force is necessary in self-defense. Sometimes being pro-life means that I can protect myself and ag against an aggressor. And if that is the case, then you admit that taking a life can be an appropriate reason to show value for life. We devalue life if we don't rise in justice against its unlawful demise. Number five, for justice to exist in the world, there must be fair retribution for criminal activity. Without the sense of the punishment should fit the crime, rehabilitation, restitution, and quarantine can be horribly abused. If we remove retribution from the picture, unpunished or underpunished crime will become normative behavior in society. We will witness the perpetual oppression of the innocent and anarchy, corruption, and violence will rise in culture instead of peace, justice, and civility. Justice in the form of restitution must be primary, or these other motives 
become injustices. Let's talk about this. In what part of life do we really believe an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? I mean, we would never say, you killed my children, so I get to kill yours. We would never say, you burned my house down, and so I get to burn yours to the ground. See, in our culture, we believe that the punishment fits the crime, yes, but we always use mechanisms of fines, imprisonment, or community service to provide restitution or retribution. Never tit-for-tat, eye-for-eye. You might say, well, well, what's the value of a life then, monetarily? Ten million dollars? No, they would say. You could never put a monetary value on a life. The only thing that expresses the value of life is the value of life itself. Someone might ask, well, what have we accomplished in taking away someone's life because of what they did? Well, here's possibly how it makes sense. In the crime, you have deprived someone of the most sacred thing we have. And you have deprived someone of something that is absolutely irreplaceable, their life. It is the deepest possible offense against humanity. The most heinous crimes deserve the deepest punishment society can bring as an expression of the sacred value of human life. A lifetime in prison does not come up to the standard of being a fitting punishment for a heinous offense. Punishment should truly fit the crime, which in this case is sometimes to deprive a person of their own sanctity of life, since he or she has blasphemed the sanctity of another person's life. To do less than that is to assign to the life of the victim the status of victim rather than desecration, and to treat the perpetrator's life as just as valuable as that of the victim. But on one level, of course, that's certainly true, as all human life is sacred. On another level, however, the perpetrator relinquished that status when he or she acted animalistically. One cannot act like a brute beast and then be expected to be treated like a child of God. People feel very uneasy about capital punishment, and so we should. It's both a tremendous responsibility and a heavy burden, much like the decision about waging war. It should always be uneasy, or we aren't really human. Discomfort, however, should not cause us to ignore uncomfortable ethical imperatives. Let's talk about this.